going to be talking today primarily about uh, Anthos and more specifically GK on prem. Uh, so, quick intros. My name is Weston Hutchins. I'm a product manager for GK on prem, and I brought some fine folks with me today. Do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, Kyle Bassett, partner at Arctic. Um, been working on Anthos project for a while, um, closely with Wes since last year at Next. So excited to show you some of the stuff we've been working on, and and with Dan and his team at Optiva. I'm Dan Dyer. I'm uh, I work in product management at Optiva, and we've been working with these guys on getting our application to work on GK on prem. Cool. So a lot of the session is going to be focused on a real world rollout. Um, so Kyle from Arctic went into Optiva, took an app they had and deployed it. And we're going to cover sort of the, the tips and tricks and the, the technical details of, of what exactly GK on prem is. But before that, I want to just talk a little bit about what problems we're trying to solve, what the vision for Anthos is as we move on. And um, you know, this really started from a lot of customers that we were talking to in GKE, like folks that were already in cloud. And they said, we're doing our modernization right now. We have, this, we have all these apps. We're trying to move them from VMs over to containers. And we're bought into a subset that can run on the cloud. But there's so many other scenarios out there that we need to run in physical data centers or in edge locations. So you know, a common scenario that I've heard is like, oh, we want to cluster in every store. Or we want to cluster at every oil site. Or we need to have uh, uh, you know, this workload running in a particular region where we can't necessarily move everything into the cloud. And the, the message from that was really we want to use Kubernetes because we've heard about all of these benefits around portability and abstraction. Um, Kubernetes has really become the standard for trying to make these environments consistent. But if you've ever tried to take a, an off-the-shelf distribution and get it up and running yourself, um, it just takes forever. And I think getting it installed is the easy part. What is really challenging for a lot of customers is all the day two operations. So, Having, uh, having scaled out masters, making sure that you can do security patches, doing disaster recovery and backups. And these were all the features that we gave out of the box with GKE. So these customers were like, well, you know, let's see if we can bring GKE on-prem and build this package software that we can deploy in these sites. And that was the sort of the beginning of our journey for Anthos. But it's much, the thing I want you guys to leave with is this is really much more than just Kubernetes. Um, we use Kubernetes as that base abstraction layer to have a portable environment. But as Kelsey says, this is really the, the start of what will hopefully be a bunch of higher level tools that can run on this platform. And I like to describe the building, building blocks of Anthos as primarily three open source technologies. Um, Kubernetes for the infrastructure pieces, Istio for the security management, service management stuff, and then finally at the top, uh, K-native cloud run type of environments where you can have that developer tooling experience so your devs don't have to work directly with like Kubernetes YAML or go into the details of configuring Istio traffic splitting. They can just work with higher level constructs. Uh, and the thing that we've really done to, <clears throat> to kind of build out Anthos and figure out how this thing is going to run is we want to take the deployment and have it running these different sites, but the, the real power and what I like to call sort of the brain that powers all of these different locations of Kubernetes, Istio, Knative, and these other pieces is this Anthos hybrid control plane. This is the stuff that runs on Google Cloud Platform. And the, the vision here is that we have a single pane of glass, we have a single hosted service that you can use to programmatically control clusters running in these different sites. And as we get into the demo later on, you'll get to see how we've kind of done this between GKE and GK on-prem, where you can start to use the same tools, the same workflows, all in the cloud, and have that go and federate out to the various locations. The, the real personas, the real people that we really want to try and target with this is you know, in, in a big enterprise organization, which you know, I imagine many of you are in, there's all these different specialty roles. And the, the key value prop of Anthos is really making sure that we have the right building blocks and the right tools for each one of them. Um, we've sort of already talked about uh, the Kubernetes layer where we can take the, the things for GK on-prem, put them on your existing hardware running on top of VMware, and keep those consistent. Uh, the Istio pieces or the, cl the cloud service mesh pieces are really there for your NetOps, your SecOps people. Those are the ones that want increased observability, better secure connections in between services, and more control over what's going on in your environment. And then the developer experience. So we want to make sure to have a nice, easy, 
uh, set of building blocks for, for having platform as a service type features so that your devs can just push code and have it deployed to the various clusters. Now, um, Anthos, like I said, is a much bigger effort. What I want to talk about specifically in this presentation is GK on prem. So this is the footprint where we take GKE and we install it on, install it on top of your stack. Um, and before we get into the details, I want Dan to introduce Optiva a little bit and give you an idea of what his use case was for this particular uh, proof of concept. So I'm going to get a bit challenged here and have to do two things at once, two different hands. So I'm Dan Dyer. Like I said, I run product management at Optiva. Um, we are a business support company that runs um, charging systems for some of the larger telecoms in the world. Um, we have over 100 customers deployed, 80 countries, do 3 billion plus transactions. The main product that we're going to talk about today, what we did the prototype with, the, the proof of concept, is what we call the Optiva charging engine. It's a tier one charging engine. That means the, this is built for the biggest telecom companies in the world. Um, it does primarily rating and charging. Uh, it's got quite a bit of functionality in terms of how you customize it, how you can build it specifically for your environment, what it integrates with. Um, but the big things here you should think about is that this is a mission critical application for telecom companies. If this doesn't work, their billing system doesn't work and they don't make any money. So pretty important from their perspective that it's it scales, that it runs at a high level of reliability, and that it can operate efficiently. So this is kind of the, the overall stack. Essentially, if you look at the, the dark blue piece there, that's the piece that we're going to focus on. It's part of a bigger system, so it has to fit into their entire environment. Um, one of the things that a lot of people don't quite internalize as they start to try to take an enterprise application and move it into more of a cloud native or Kubernetes environment is that it's not just take your app, break it up maybe a little bit, maybe not, shove it over into something like a VM like you would have traditionally and then run it. Um, there's a decent amount of work that needs to be done here in terms of modifying your application. So it's really important that you think about how you're going to containerize and take advantage of some of the specific cloud native applications and technologies out there. Um, it's a good opportunity to actually spend some time looking at how you can simplify your, simplify your app. It's also important to think about some of the benefits that you're trying to get out of this and invest in those, such as the scaling and the automated deployment and update. So if you look at the diagram on the, the left there, you know that's your typical virtualization model. Um, as we moved into a, a cloud native Kubernetes based deployment. Um, some of the things that we really focused on, like I said, first of all, is you really got to think about how you're going to change the, the, the architecture of your application to take advantage of a lot of the cloud native patterns. That's critical both from the perspective of how your application is going to behave, but also how you're going to be able to efficiently operate and, and uh, deploy it. Um, a lot of Legacy applications are using a bunch of proprietary technology. This is also an opportunity for you to go out and start looking at using open source tools. Like, you know, typically, like for example, we moved a lot of our proprietary monitoring tools over to the Elk stack, and then leveraging some things like Stackdriver and things like that. Um, key to the delivery of this is our ability to actually improve our scalability and our operational efficiency. So. You know, if all we did was take this thing and move it to the cloud or move it to a private cloud and we didn't get a whole lot of benefit out of it, that was an interesting exercise, but, you know, why did we do it? So it's really critical that you think about what you're trying to achieve out of this. You know, what are your goals in terms of your end, end SLA, your end operational efficiency, whether you're trying to achieve um, higher reliability or a lower TCO, those are all things that you need to think about in advance, and we spent quite a bit of time looking at that. Um, in any enterprise environment, but especially in telecom, you know, it's, it's relatively conservative. People are not willing to bet the farm on some new technology right away, so it's important that you give people an incremental step through their, their options so that they can actually feel like they can take the jumps as they need to, as they're ready to, and that their business is able to adapt. So, you know, on, the, on a typical legacy environment, you're sitting there with a pretty rigid environment. You have to pre-provision everything. There's a high cost 
Um, as we move into the Kubernetes on-prem kind of scenario, we get a much better flexibility in terms of our um, deployment options. You can leverage bare metal and a, a variety of private clouds to do that. The next step, really, when you think about moving this, if you're going to do it incrementally, is to, to start to split out some of your systems and run that in a hybrid scenario. And then finally, you, uh, if you're trying to make this journey, you move all the way to the public cloud and everything's running on a managed service in the cloud. And that where, is where, from our perspective, you get the most TCO benefit, you get the most efficiency, um, you take advantage of the, all the reasons why Google Cloud exists. Um, the end state, the, you know, the state of nirvana, if you want to call it, in terms of from the provider side of things, is that we can deploy pretty much the same application with small amounts of differences, whether it's in the public cloud or private cloud. You know, that allows us to be much more efficient. It also allows us to run the same code. It allows people to migrate easily. The hybrid story or the public cloud story becomes much better when you do that. And so that's really the promise that we see with GK on-prem is that if you look at this diagram, you know, besides some of our storage and database managed services that we're trying to use in the cloud, we can pretty much end up with the same application. And as you'll see with the proof of concept, that's where we ended up. Cool. Uh, so before I hand it over to, to Kyle, I want to give uh, at least some context to some like how does GK on-prem work from an architecture perspective? So you get the bits for GK on-prem, and how this comes packaged is you get an admin OVA workstation. This is uh, uh, just a tool you can spin up on a VM in your VMware environment um, that you can use to bootstrap the rest of your cluster. So the first thing you do is you run prepare. This runs some pre-validation checks. Um, we've added support for downloading container images to things like private registries for folks that have offline and air-gapped installs. We've also added support during the install process for things like static IP allocation for folks that don't have DHCP set up in those environments. But the, the end state is that you end up with this, this single long-lived node called an admin control plane. And this is really the orchestrator for all of the on-prem clusters. Um, all of the commands that you're going to be using interact with this admin control plane. And for instance, if you want to create new clusters, we've called them user clusters in, in this example, um, you go in and run a create cluster command and go and spin up these different environments. So right now, we do have a separate utility from G Cloud. Uh, over time, I think you'll start to see G Cloud, our CLI, merge with some of these commands so that we can invoke, uh, invoke these from, from a single environment. But for now, we've just built a nice lightweight CLI package in order to spin up these new clusters. The, once you have all of your clusters <clears throat> spun up or just even a single cluster, the next step um, is registering this cluster with our Cloud Console. And this is the piece where we can start to do more of the single pane of glass and also the remote management um, of GK on-prem. So you walk through a simple flow in our Cloud Console. The things that it will ask you for is doing uh, some metadata exchange and then some credentials to access that cluster. Um, after you go and uh, uh, connect, like one of the pieces that gets downloaded is this lightweight connection agent. This thing sits next to your API server and allows us to go from the Cloud Console and reach into that API server and issue a cube, uh, cube cuddle command. Um, one of the nice things about this is that every authentication flow for this happens as the end user credential. So if your developers want to use this, they will only see things that they are authenticated to see, even for these on-prem clusters. So if there are certain namespaces that they only have visibility to, those will only show up, the, only those namespaces will show up for them inside the console. Now, the, probably the, the number one question we get is around this external connectivity. Like, what is this? How does it work? Um, this is really, uh, we wanted something that was nice, quick, and easy, out of the box experience. So um, the GK Connect agent is, is really a lightweight gRPC proxy that we can use to access these API servers and running in these various environments. No VPN is needed, no direct interconnect to get these things set up, and you have a secure connection to the control plane. This really is just for control plane data, so this is not like a replacing a fat pipe of monitoring, telemetry, and all that stuff. They have their own data, data pipeline, data path things, but this really gives us the ability to have that single pane of glass experience for all of the different environments. We're gonna talk a lot more about networking and storage a bit later, but we wanted to do it as part of the demo so you could actually see it working uh, in real time. So with that, uh, Kyle, over to you. Um, all right, so, um, 
we decided we're going to give a, a pretty in-depth demo. Original plan was to do a live demo, but there's a lot to cover, so I thought it'd be better if we covered it all, and we're going to have more of an open discussion and, and give you some opinions on what we put together. Um, the Optiva app is a pretty cool app. They've done a, a good job making it cloud native, and um, it runs in a GKE today, so much of the exercise of what we wanted to do as far as goals was develop a lot of knowledge around it and prove that we could port this application in a short period of time over to GK on-prem. Um, and also just get something working and, and then start to scale test it and start to do all the resiliency things that we wanted to do. So we we're pretty pleasantly surprised with uh, um, how quick we got it up and working with Dan teams, um, we got through it pretty quickly. So we'll dive into the details and I know a lot of people haven't seen it at all, so we're gonna try to show what it looks like. Um, we did this in five weeks, so we had a pretty uh, aggressive timeline. That is everything from getting the servers that we used uh, racked and stacked and getting ESX on them, um, deploying all the base components. Um, Optiva leverages cloud build and GCR in the cloud today, so we wanted to be able to leverage that process and that CI process and pull the images down locally and then be able to deploy them. Um, everything was done in Helm templates, so that made it a lot easier for us to deploy and uh, get things up, but we also needed things like persistent storage that we're gonna get um, into and talk about those aspects. And week four was really about, let's start to throw some load at this and let's see if the uh, scalability components that Optiva has in their application, can we scale pods, can we scale nodes on the back end? Um, we really uh, beat up on the cluster pretty good, so we had to get another node added this week to, to be able to actually test some of the scaling components. And, and we wrapped up with documentation and making sure everybody uh, knew what was going on. Um, that slide's not really painting properly for some reason, but it was a pretty cool project. That is a map of the world. Um, <laughs> just picture it. Um, and, we were 100% remote. None of us met in person. Um, Optiva has a very distributed team of experts around that are, are very skilled. Um, so we did this all over Slack, Google Hangouts, um, collaboration tools. Um, so it just goes to show you don't need the uh, card pass to go into a data center to build a private cloud anymore. You can do it uh, completely remotely. Um, so that was a, a, a pretty cool project to see it be completely distributed. Um, so I guess we're going to dive over to the, uh, the demo. Yeah, one, uh, one of the things I wanted to see on the previous slide was just, um, you know, we packaged some stuff out of the box with GK on-prem. You get things like monitoring, you get OIDC connections through identity providers, but, um, you know, Optiva had a lot of existing tools and technologies like Sysdig and Harbor and Vaults and stuff like that. And then as part of the proof of concept, like Kyle went in there and plumbed those into the system, which we'll show right now. So you can take your existing stack and uh, integrate those into GK on-prem. Yeah, I think the main point with this is really it was just another region for us to deploy to in the end. Um, we were able to use a lot of the same tools and techniques, a few changes obviously around storage and, and networking, which we're going to get into, but it really just looks like another deployment target for Optiva today, which is really what, as Dan talked about, is, was really the ultimate goal. Um, so we'll flip over to the demo. Um, so we're going to go through a bunch of different components here, and I think we'll all have, we'll have a few comments to say around them. Um, we're going to start at what, what this looks like at the, at the very least of it. So I've created some aliases in this demo. So you're going to see A is your kubectl, but it's pointing at the um, admin cluster, so the, the part Wes talked about that manages the environment and, and can bootstrap additional clusters. U is the user cluster. User cluster is where we put all the Optiva applications and all the pods and all the supporting infrastructure. You're going to see some namespaces. So if we look at the um, admin cluster, so you, you, know, you recognize these type of namespaces in a regular Kubernetes cluster. If we look at the user cluster, you see things like GK Connect that Wes talked about. You see Harbor. You see um, Istio, so, um, and the OCE pieces are um, the Optiva application, so that's where we put all of uh, the pods that went into there. If you look at nodes, the admin cluster is fairly small. Um, Multi-master support is coming in the, uh, in the release that's uh, dropping very soon. And then if you look at our bottom cluster, um, we have 11 nodes. So essentially these are 11 worker nodes um, that are able to process load. Um, and we've done some scaling up and scaling down. That's why you see one of them is a little bit shorter time. Um, we, we got this demo put together yesterday. So you're probably wondering what it looks like in vCenter. Um, it looks just like any of your other cluster, any of your other vCenter environments. There's nothing really special about it. We started with a clean cluster. We obviously need um, 
to be able to call the API. And GK on-prem is fully orchestrated, all the uh, VM provisioning, provisioning, you're really not having to go and clobber around uh, vCenter at all after you set it up. So once you provision a user cluster, this piece is all automated. We're leveraging data stores on the back end. We have a few different data stores, SSD, HDD. Um, we're also leveraging persistent storage, which we'll talk about a little bit. But as far as this goes, it, it looks a lot like any other cluster. Um, we're leveraging a template to be able to spin up the base node before it gets bootstrapped. Um, we've got a bunch of different data stores. We've got some different virtual switches. There's a lot of flexibility on how that stuff's configured. And we've just put everything in a resource group to, to keep it separate. So no reason why you couldn't use a shared cluster that you already have to get this up and running. Um, clearly, we need to be able to call the API and orchestrate a lot of these capabilities. Um, another piece that's part of this is we are using an F5 virtual appliance to do all the ingress pieces, and that's also orchestrated. So if you do carve out an ingress inside of the environment, it will use um, the container, container connector piece that F5 provides to carve out these. We're going to show a demo of, of how we're able to do that dynamically near the end. Um, so it's able to you know, orchestrate all the front end. I know, Wes, there's always lots of questions around ingress networking and some stuff that's coming. Do you want to comment on, on some of the stuff that's coming down the road? Yeah, so one of the, the common questions we get is, uh, what's the dependency on F5? Um, so for we really wanted that out-of-box experience where you could use Kubernetes to provision uh, load balancer support right out of the box. But we have heard from customers that they already are running things like HAProxy or Nginx instead of F5. So one of the things we are going to be adding uh, pretty soon is going to be the ability to bring your own load balancer and plug into that. I think longer term, you'll start to see maybe a Google-provided load balancer out of the box, but we're just uh, we're kind of listening to the customer feedback around some of these hard dependencies or I have different environments already in there. Yep. Um, so you can see here that we are looking at the user cluster. If you look in the top right partition, um, we also have the admin cluster. As we extend more, uh, more clusters, you'll get more partitions, obviously. So these are the base ones. You can see there's an Istio space we've got. Our virtual server list has, has been populated through um, when we're plumbing these, these pieces. Um, we've been playing around with Container Connector a little bit there we, that we can put F5 in the SDN range and skip the whole node port piece. So that's something we're looking at doing and then introducing other load balancers and things like that. Yeah, I think one other thing you know, from the application provider perspective that we're coming from, you know, it's critical that uh, we don't want to be in the entire infrastructure business, right? We want to be able to go in and fit into the environment that the customer's in. And so the ability to take advantage of a private cloud like this and put some standard in, um, implementation on top of it, like GKE, and then us be able to just leverage that and go in and take advantage of that and take advantage of the infrastructure that they, the customer's already built, to me, that's a, a critical value add here that, that this is shown to be pretty successful at. OK, so uh, Wes talked about um, the connector and where you manage this from. So not everybody's a, a Kubernetes expert. Not everybody wants to be running kubectl commands. Um, so we can leverage Google Cloud Platform's admin station or, or web UI to be able to look at all our clusters and start to see what's going on with them and diving into the details. So I showed you earlier the node list. This is the exact same view um, through here. And you'll be able to see you get quite a bit of insight into what's going on into here. Um, we're going to show some stack driver integration and stuff like that. But if you look at our cluster, here's our cluster. Um, there's no reason why we couldn't have uh, other regions that are cloud-based in here. The whole idea is it's a common experience across your on-prem and your cluster um, inside the cloud. Yeah, and that really is uh, critical to that hybrid strategy we were talking about, that if you can have the same point of control and management and visibility to both your on-prem and the stuff that you start to move into the cloud, then it just becomes that much easier to make that move. Yeah, one of the things that I hear a lot, and I heard it from Dan too, is, is these enterprise customers who are trying to train their IT staff and their developers to think more like the cloud. Well, this is that bridge where you can start to use a lot of the tooling, but you can still operate it in on-prem. Yeah, so we'll look through the, obviously there's going to be more components added to this, but we can look at all our pods. So, you know, usually you're trying to, uh, kubectl, describe, pod, get the pod name. You can really drill down through it all through here. Um, and you can see what, what storage it's using. You can see any events. You can also look at the YAML configuration. Um, so this is a big piece of, I think, what people are looking for as far as a managed solution, is having the toolkit to be able to have manage upgrades and manage the lifecycle of my clusters, be able to provision 
um, pieces through there. We're working uh, pretty hard to build a lot of the CI CD toolkit into this workflow um, and be able to use a lot of Google toolkits that we were comfortable with using in cloud and leverage them on prem as well. So I mentioned storage. Here's all the PVs. Everyone says uh, applications that move to Kubernetes don't need state. Uh, that's, we always find out they need state about an hour into the discussion. So there's quite a few PV requirements in this environment. Um, we'll dive into that. You can see all the config maps and uh, configuration. Secrets are obviously protected. You'd need an elevated account to be able to go in and look at any of that stuff. Um, anything you want to say about just the, the experience, Wes, around um, managing this stuff and leveraging some of the other tools? Yeah, so uh, you know, I, I think the, the long-term vision for this is that all of those cloud services that you were mentioning, so cloud build, cloud uh, uh, hosted Spinnaker deployments, um, uh, doing policy management inside the cloud as well. These are the pieces that we want to have run in the cloud environment, be, be able to access these, these clusters. And so for the most part, we want this to feel, I think Kyle said it best, he's like, this is an extension of your region, right? It's just running in a different location. You know, I think long term, you know, let's say over the next couple of years, we'll start to see more things where we have, let's say, global load balancers that can maybe route traffic intelligently through clusters running in these various environments. So there's a really cool long-term story about how we can have this brain that can federate out to these different environments. Great. Um, so stack drivers integrated. We can get metrics and logs into uh, GCP uh, right from the clusters. Um, Wes mentioned some of the other toolkit we deployed. So we deployed Sysdig really early. We knew that we needed to test this at scale and we wanted to get a really good baseline. So it was a good way to start from nothing with no load and then ramp the load up and really get into the network stack and see what was going. Um, so we've created some base dashboards. Now the nice part is we've got a good baseline. We can really start ramping up the load till this thing starts to fall down and really learn where we need to scale it. Um, we can dive right into the network view. Really, we're looking at every single system call across all microservices, and we can drill down to see the length of time and what's exactly happening in it. So getting these, these dashboards in place really sets us up for future success as we start to tune this. Yeah, and one, one of the things that you'll find as you start to try to move a legacy app to be cloud native is that, so you're going to decompose that, you're going to break it into little pieces, and all of the learnings that you had before are still relevant but you're gonna find out that you have new bottlenecks or you know, maybe things aren't quite connecting the way you used to think they were. And so having these kind of tools in here to be able to go down and drill down and find out where your problems are, where your new bottlenecks are, what kind of performance you're getting, uh, that's critical to the success of the project. And, and this really helped us out because we did run into a few issues where we were either under provisioned or had made some bad choices in terms of configuration and we were easily able to come back and figure out what the problem was and, and address it pretty easily. Yeah, so it's just deployed as a daemon set on all the nodes. Um, we'll probably wait for questions, but. I think that's what you said. What was the tool you used? Oh, it's Sysdig. So Sysdig's a SaaS tool, monitoring analytics tool, does, uh, really focused on containers. Okay. So it's capturing every system call, essentially, and, and it's got a whole analytics engine. The nice part is the dashboard. So you know, being able to graph data and look at it over time and saying, why did it get slow and drilling down? That's what we really used it for. So helped us aggregate all those logs and things like that. No problem. So I mentioned Harbor. Um, so Harbor's a CNCF project. We're a CNCF member. So we wanted to avoid having to pull container images down every time we built them over the, the, the pipe that Optiva has up to GCP. So we deployed Harbor as a container um, to look after the registry components. So we have a sync job. When their build process runs, we can pull the containers down to the local LAN. And then when we're building and deploying the applications via the Helm templates, we're just pulling off the local network. Um, so Harbor was a, a nice little registry to use, really easy to get up and running. No reason why you couldn't leverage Artifactory or some enterprise registry that you're already using today. This is just the way we solved it for this project. Yeah, and this is another sort of enterprise specific thing. You know, If you're gonna try to take this approach to do this with your application, Obviously, you know, there's a high sensitivity to churn and being able to pre-qualify things in the customer environment. So having the ability to stage like this and then try things out um, in parallel, that's a, a huge strength of this that you wouldn't necessarily get in a traditional environment where you'd have to build up an entire parallel system. Yeah, so I think we have around, I think there's upwards of 60 or 80 images that we're leveraging in this. Um, so everybody's always interested in storage, so we thought we'd cover a little bit on the storage side. Um, 
<clears throat> Natively, the default storage provider for GKE today is uh, a vSphere cloud provider. So essentially what that does is allows you to dynamically provision volumes, uh, block-based volumes, um, via the platform. So what it's doing is dynamically carving out a VMDK on the back end and attaching it to the host and then providing that access back to the container. So we leverage this for anything that needed persistent storage. Um, there is a NFS provider that has RWX. We didn't have time to test that yet. It's something we're definitely looking at doing. Other pieces that we're looking to test as we move forward are more cloud native storage options. So um, we did some testing of Rook, which is another CNCF project, but we're looking at things like Robin and Portworks. Um, a lot of customers are leveraging like a backend uh, NetApp appliance, but they have a Trident plugin that you can leverage. So storage is, is what's nice about it. If you don't know Kubernetes very well, is it's very, very pluggable. All the components are pluggable. You could run multiple storage options here. And the way they work, and we'll show you in a little bit, is it's just a default storage class, or you have different storage classes. You may have a storage class for SSD, a storage class for HDD. You can put policies and rules and quotas and stuff around that. Um, so I'll show you how easy it is. Um, anybody, again, if you're not familiar with Kubernetes and you've been asking for volumes in a VM world, you know, change record, wait, go buy the guy a coffee. The idea behind all this stuff is it's all very declarative. So all you have to do to carve a storage out in this environment is this simple YAML configuration. I run that. I immediately get a PV created, and then in a couple minutes, I'll end up getting that um, ready. So now we've got a two gig volume ready to go for me to leverage in my application. Um, literally takes a couple seconds. What you'll see now is we call using GovC, we're calling the vSphere API. You can see it's carved out the VMDKs on the back end for us. And that's just leveraging a regular data store that you would leverage in your VMware environment. Nothing special, just need the plugin. So we'll just go ahead and delete the PV. Um, you can see the PV's gone. We'll call vCenter again, and uh, there's nothing left. So um, that's just a look at storage. Storage is, is something that, um, like I said, everyone thinks all these Kubernetes workloads are ephemeral. They're generally not. There's a lot of stuff that does need state, so there's lots of good storage providers out there that we can leverage. Um, Next, we're going to talk about auto-scaling a little bit. Auto-scaling seems to be a conversation that I have with every customer, and we always have lots of uh, religious debates on what they really want. But um, Optiva really has a um, business case for this, and it's built into their platform. So Dan, do you want to talk about just the advantages and why you guys feel it's so important and what it does for you? Sure. So in the telecom business, especially calling, for example, or even data, it tends to be very cyclical. So both across the day, you can see cycles as well as across the year. So, you know, first thing in the morning, you might have a spike in calls, or on a certain holiday, you might have a spike in calls. So if you look at this um, chart that we have here, that's what that wavy curve is, a sine wave kind of thing. And, you know, you also tend to have some kind of long-term trend in terms of growth, or you might even have long-term trend, hopefully not, but you might have a long-term trend in drop of traffic. And so if you look at that step, um, line there. That's traditionally how you have dealt with it in a hardware bare metal kind of environment. You have to predict in advance. You have to over provision. You, if you under provision, then you get that little red triangle, which means you've just failed your application on a probably pretty regular basis. People are dropping calls. And if you're way down there below the blue line, then you're, you're over provision. You're paying for a bunch of hardware to generate heat. So it's really critical for our business, and there's a lot of other businesses like this that have these kind of patterns. And so if we can, in, in the public cloud, this is a no-brainer, right? You can provision um, VMs in the background. But even in a, um, in a private cloud environment, if you have shared infrastructure with a little bit of additional um, capacity, or you're trying to do some testing, or even you have, a say, a special um, holiday that you need to pre-provision for, um, this scenario can take advantage of that, those, the auto-scaling capabilities that we have um, in GKE and also in our application so that you're not wasting a lot of hardware and you're able to adapt as you need to go. So we're going to show, um, it, when Dan and I first talked to you, one of the big things we wanted success criteria was let's get to the point where we can auto-scale. So the discussion went, well, pods are somewhat easy. Their application can scale. Um, in cloud, you know, Google's got tons of capacity, so that part problem's pretty easy to solve. Um, 
but in the VMware world, we need to have capacity and essentially another node is another VM, so we can orchestrate and automate that. Um, since the whole platform's declarative, as we talked about, is um, it was pretty doable. We've done some work with Configuration Manager to be able to do this more in a GitOps fashion so that everything would be source of truth in Git. You do a pull request, you change your node count, gets approved, automatically goes and spins up the cluster. So we'll show you the capability of that. We've also, we're putting out a blog, I think, later today that demos that. Um, but you can see here we have 11 nodes running. And what this is, this OCS process, is essentially the, the workers that are processing all the, um, the call volume and doing all the analytics and all the billing. Um, so it can only handle so much load. And Optiva's application, when it gets under certain conditions, it knows how to scale up. Um, so we're going to go through the use case. And you can see here um, we're using Grafana and Prometheus on the back end as part of their application. So the green represents calls per second. So this test, we got up to about 60,000 calls per second with this environment. The blue line represents number of pods that are running. So we're generally running that one pod that I showed you, but once load comes up, we need to scale to two and then beyond if we keep cranking it up. So if you look at these graphs, you can see we were upwards of uh, 30,000 transactions here. Um, we scaled down, so our pods scaled back down. So this is pod level scaling in Kubernetes, working off metrics. Um, we're pushing about 10,000 a second at this point in time. Um, so this stuff's fairly out of the box. And you can see we ran a lot of tests, and we were pushing load, dropping load, pushing load, dropping load. So you can see it's very consistently scaling up and scaling down. And our error rates are almost nothing. We'll be able to handle the load. Um, Optiva's got a nice little load generator for us. So um, they built a, a great little tool that we can go in and just slide the bar. Um, so we'll jump it up to about 40,000 a second right now. The nice part is uh, we're leveraging Prometheus on the back end. Everything's real time on the graph. So you can see um, their software has said, OK, Kubernetes says, let's spin up another um, pod with three more containers to handle this. So load goes up um, pretty quickly. Um, we're pod scales to two or starts to bring all the containers up. And Dan mentioned that red line in, your, in his diagram earlier. So we're up to 40,000. The red lines representing our error rate is starting to go up um, because as I showed you earlier, we were pushing the cluster from a resource perspective pretty hard with our, with our five nodes and our 11, 11 um, nodes on the backside. But here you can represent now the second pod is running here. Just one comment. I mean, the scaling we're doing here is, this is a nice thing, once again, if you're not that familiar with Kubernetes. Um, I mean, this is just a standard autoscaler based on CPU. You can do a lot more elaborate things, and we're looking at implementing those in the future. But getting something like this working in Kubernetes and in this environment is, is not rocket science, right? So if you if you built, structured your application properly so that the pieces can be independently run and scaled in containers, then it's pretty straightforward to just build yourself autoscaler in there that can handle that based on CP load, for example. So we've scaled the load back down. Um, so things are going to start behaving again because it's going to match the capacity that we need. Um, you'll see that. Um, Kubernetes is terminating that other pods. We don't need it anymore. Now we're back down to one load. We're back down to a standard processing. Now, obviously, the issue with that use case was we didn't have enough nodes on the back end. So we have to solve the node scaling problem so that we can solve the pod scaling problem. Um, and everything in GK I mentioned is declarative. So Wes, do you want to comment on just the approach of how you built the automation and why you built it the way you did? Yeah, so uh, a lot of the architecture for GK on-prem is based off of something in the open source we were working at, we've been working on called the Cluster API. And what it allows you to do is define the shape uh, of your cluster, the Kubernetes version, the add-ons you want to install, and then you can also define the nodes. So um, you can define what, uh, what images you're going to deploy on them, what uh, Kubernetes components are running on those. And what Kyle is going to show here is like scaling at this point is really just a simple matter of going and changing the node count from 11 to 12, checking that into a Git repository, and then the cluster is looking for these changes, syncing them down, and then it's just a matter of our machinery going and saying, hey, I noticed the change. I need to move from 11 to 12. Let's go and bump the, the cluster up. And the, the really nice thing about this is, you know, we're, you'll probably hear the term like cluster is cattle. We're going to start moving down this direction where you can have these you know, portable metadata environments that describe your clusters, and you can spin these up in different locations really quickly. But the source of truth is all in a Git repo, and it's all declarative. And you can put linters around that. You can put change request validation and things like that. Super nice way to, to deploy and manage clusters. 
So I paused it here for a second. The bottom right-hand corner is us monitoring the vCenter API. Um, so you see I, we saved the file in the top left. Automatically, we've got uh, vCenter API picking up that that changed, the declarative nature. And we'll flip over to vCenter in a second. You're going to see that the nodes are automatically coming up, and they're going to get added to the cluster. So you see here on the bottom, we're powering on the VM from template. Um, within a very short period of time, the node comes up. You can see it's up. We don't have an IP address yet, but it's going to get an IP address very quickly. And it's going to join the cluster. Um, and now we've got an extra node in the cluster. So you see on the bottom left, we've got our node online now. It's been on for one second. It's not ready. It's, it's bootstrapping. Um, and that'll change pretty quickly and be able to come onto a ready state. Um, one of the interesting things that we found out early is um, Optiva in GKE makes a couple kernel tweaks to their, uh, to their nodes. So we had never really tested that. So it was good to know that we actually could make those tweaks that they needed that they had in cloud. So top right corner, um, we just solved this currently with an Ansible playbook. So we wrote an idpotent um, Ansible playbook. We just you know, add to the inventory file, run it. It'll automatically make the, the kernel tweak, reboot the host, and now the node's a first-class citizen in the cluster. Um, plan on this is since the, um, we have a VM template, what we're going to do is just put it into the template, and then we won't need the Ansible playbook to run. So it'll just be spun into the template. I know this can be kind of hard to see for folks in the back, but we'll, we'll publish this online, and we'll also have a blog post that goes into a lot more of these details. Yeah, so in this case, we're just, uh, this is just straight up Ansible. We're running it against the node. The node's going to um, take the change. You can see it skipped all the ones that we've already um, made the change to. Node will go not ready, and then it's really fast. Within uh, 20, 30 seconds, the node comes back up. Um, and what you'll find is when I describe the node, um, we've automatically deployed all the daemon sets. So we have a sysdig uh, daemon set. We've got a bunch of different um, daemon sets that are running for the environment that we need. Um, and now we'll get to the point where let's, you know, let's scale this up even higher and let's see how it performs this time um, from an error perspective. So we pump it up to 62,000 uh, transactions per second. You're going to immediately see the Grafana dashboards are going to ramp up. We're going to get our second pod scaled. Um, and we don't have a lot of errors because we've got the right capacity to be able to handle, handle the volume. Um, so having these load generators and loads tests were just really critical for us to be able to actually test this stuff, trial and error, some different tweaks and settings. And having a really good monitoring setup allowed us to kind of get the baseline of that. Um, so two other quick things to show you. We're going to, everyone's wondering why haven't they talked about the networking yet. So we'll talk about networking quickly. Um, Wes, do you want to comment just generally on the networking strategy and yeah, so and to the so the way we've we've architected the the footprint of GCon Prem is that each cluster is an island, so they form an IP server mesh in between them, but everything that is connected to outside the cluster has to get added out. Um, we are using BGP, so we do have a, a, a theoretical like 50 node max for a lot of these cluster sizes that we've started out at, but we're going to expand this over time. Um, and yeah, we use Calico for network policy. I already was talked about F5. We use that for the L4 load balancer, where we can actually go and spin up service type load balancer and have that route traffic into it. Um, and eventually, we will have the ability to make that pl public, pl uh, pluggable, so you can actually go and bring a, a, a different load balancer service in there. Um, so I mentioned you know, how hard it is to carve storage. We all know how hard it is to get a rule put into your F5 box and how many tickets and coffees that takes. Um, this is, if you're not familiar with Kubernetes, it's kind of the same thing. We just run a simple kube cuddle command. Um, we've got a famous beer Giphy app that we've just deployed there. We've also created the endpoint. This is the entire configuration of the endpoint. This integrates into F5, so all of this is sending API calls. You can see we go back to our F5. We're in the user space. We don't have, we've got um, four endpoints. If I refresh, we automatically get our default ingress. If we go look at that, you can see we've got a cluster IP. Um, we're leveraging, if we go to our application that we just deployed, we've got our random beer Giphy <laughs> up and running in a matter of seconds. So. Um, so that's it for the demo side. Um, maybe we'll flip back to the slides and, and just close out. So tips and lessons learned. Everyone's probably interested on that. I think we can all make a few comments. Is environment sizing's you know important? We knew this was a big application when we first started with four nodes. We got the application up, but we were like right at the edge of leveraging the amount of CPU and memory that we needed. So. Um, 
Optiva being a very agile team, this cluster is actually deployed in Berlin. Um, we were able to get another node added to it, and we we're able to keep the project moving. So, you know, make sure you size your environment. We got into a few um, interesting issues that we need to look into is when we were pushing load heavy against uh, pods that had PV requirements, um, DRS was starting to do more than it should have and started moving environments around. So we decided to disable DRS for a lot of these environments. We really didn't need, it need stuff moving around. Um, you know, I mentioned monitoring tools, um, getting all that stuff in place early so you have a good baseline. Um, anything else you guys want to add to the? Yeah, I mean, one of the things I think is a natural tendency is to to wait on spend a lot of time thinking about your operational model before you do this, right? A lot of people try to try it out and see what happens. And, and I think that, you know, it's, it's really critical, especially jumping into a new environment like this, to really think about your operational model and things like what type of monitoring you need to put in place, what do you want to monitor, you know, who's getting access to that, that kind of stuff. I think the other really cool thing about this was, we already alluded to this, but you know, we had already spent the time to move our app to GKE in the cloud, um, but I was expecting a lot more work in terms of refactoring our scripts, in terms of deployment and things like that to get this to work. And yet we had pretty minimal amount of work there. So that's a really nice thing. So if you're gonna invest the, the time in here, I think the, the promise of GKE on-prem relative to the cloud, it's definitely delivering on that, so. Yeah, other piece I would mention is, uh, you know, put some time into your deployment, CI, CD deployment strategies. Optiva had done a really good job, so there was a couple of times when we tested some weird things and we wanted to start from a clean slate again, and that, you know, that was an hour and a half effort to go and redeploy their entire application after we built the, the new cluster, which was maybe a 40, 50 minute exercise because we've automated a lot of it. Um, so it gave us a clean slate again. And if we saw weird things happening because we were experimenting, we didn't have to troubleshoot and wonder if that was causing something. We just repaved the infrastructure. Let's just rebuild it and let's start from a clean slate again. So this cluster got built um, Sunday night again, and then we did this demo last night. So we're really comfortable at standing it up and, and rebuilding it again. Other things to think about is, Dan mentioned it, but leveraging Helm charts and just, you know, Spending an extra couple hours writing that Ansible playbook saved us a lot of time down the road. So when we had to build the cluster, we didn't have to SSH into 11 VMs and go and do the kernel parameter. So just roll up your sleeves, you know, do some Google searching. Most of the information's out there. Reach out to us. We'll share some of these playbooks and stuff that we've uh, figured out along the way. And um, the only other thing I would say is we did a stand-up every day with the team, and everybody showed up to it. Some days it was just a chat, but it also removed any roadblocks and kept everybody really in the loop, which was going on. So being a distributed team and not seeing each other all the time, we had 11 o'clock stand up every day, and it really helped the project uh, move forward. And, and it helped us get rid of any roadblocks and also provided good updates to the stakeholders because we had a pretty short runway to get all this ready for next. So Yeah. I would say, and uh, this probably gonna be a lot of questions, we'll be at the booth a lot. Um, you can also you know, find us on Twitter, e like email us, we'll figure out how to get in touch and answer those questions for you. Um, and I guess the closing thing is just, if you guys like this talk, go and give us some feedback, um, and we'll be around.